Hello and welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I am Shriya. In today's episode, we talk about Honduras announcement to open diplomatic relations with China, health workers in South Africa ending a week-long strike, and finally, 150 women's national team players right to FIFA demanding equal pay before the 2023 World Cup. Honduras President Yomara Castro on Tuesday announced plans to open diplomatic relations with China in a move that will leave behind the Central American nation's relationship with Taiwan. According to Honduran F Foreign Minister Eduardo Enrique Reina, the decision is largely based on economic interests of the country, but it is not completely unexpected as moving closer to Beijing was a part of Castro's presiden presidential campaign. We are now joined by Anish from People's Dispatch with more details on the story. Welcome back on the episode, Anish. So, major development this one and uh, what led to Honduras making this decision and uh, what led to it taking a different stance, you know, changing its stance uh, from Taiwan? Yeah, so in, uh, you know, in we have to talk about the domestic politics before we talk about the wider geopolitical implications. So in this case, the domestic politics has a lot to do uh, with how things uh, panned out. You had the Honduran president, Shamara Castro, uh, having campaigned uh, as part of her foreign policy, uh, uh, you know, promises uh, to, uh, to push for uh, relations with China, which is the People's Republic of China, and to cut off relations with, the, with Taiwan, which uh, calls itself the Republic of China. So in this case, it is taking the uh, you know the same position that many countries around the world, almost almost all countries except for a dozen now, uh, have taken in with respect to the one China policy, and it's also a practical decision in many ways. Uh, but it has been held back primarily because of the kind of governments that they had uh, for so long, uh, which uh, we have to remember uh, in, you know, the geopolitical sense as, uh, as we move on to, like, this is uh, what uh, many of the mainstream media calls uh, the backyard of the United States. So the level of influence that U.S. imperialism had uh, uh, in supporting a whole host of reactionary political groups, uh, not just in Honduras, but across uh, Central America and the whole of Latin America, uh, we have seen many of them uh, hold on to this very rigid sort of anti-communist position uh, when it came to Taiwan and uh, or, or when it came to China and uh, continued relations with Taiwan, even though it made very little difference uh, or actually uh, gave them no additional benefits whatsoever. So uh, so this whole point, like the, the statement that the foreign minister made which is that of uh, this decision being primarily uh, based on economic interest has a lot of merit to it. It's just that uh, it took uh, a political change, a massive political change. We have to remember Castro won with an emphatic uh, majority last year. So uh, not last year, 2021. And uh, she came to power last year. And uh, obviously the sea change in, politi in Honduran politics was what uh, eventually led to this uh, decision. Right. And another question would be that uh, what are likely to be the strategic implications of this decision for Honduras? Because US is a major trade partner. What are we expecting to follow now? Well, there will definitely be some displeasure uh, on the part of the United States. Uh, uh, already China, uh, sorry, Taiwan is airing its, uh, uh, you know, uh, discontentment on the matter, but uh, and we are we can expect uh, several right wing groups within Honduras to also oppose the decision. Uh, but uh, in the overall sense, uh, it it is part of you know a sort of ideological battle because this is not the first time uh, that or uh, that uh, a Central American or a Latin American country have changed positions when it came to what China they recognize. And uh, if you take, uh, you know, even the recent case of uh, uh, Nicaragua, which uh, had cut off ties in 2021, uh, if you see the history, it actually had a very brief period between 1985 and 1990 when it had relations with the PRC, with Beijing. Uh, but the only reason uh, being that Ortega was the president then, 
And after he lost the presidency, the right-wing government uh, just uh, promptly cut off. One of the first things that they did was to promptly cut off ties with China and resume relations with Taiwan. So this is also a part of the larger ideological battle that is being waged not only in Central America. We already uh, we have now uh, two countries left that still recognize Taiwan, but also in the Pacific region where you have several uh, nations still uh, holding on to this uh, vestige of uh, Cold War post, uh, uh, influenced by, uh, you know, reactionary politics uh, that was uh, supported and still is supported by U.S. imperialist powers. So in all of these cases, obviously, you have, uh, you know, a la larger ideological battle uh, being waged. Uh, we have to wait and see uh, if how long this is going to be. But obviously, uh, this is a better step to the future because smaller countries like Honduras definitely need aid. Our uh, countries that are in dire straits uh, since the pandemic are ones that are going to be the worst affected uh, because of the climate emergency that we are facing right now. So definitely uh, looking for better economic prospects uh, at the time when China is a major uh, economic superpower uh, and, you know, going for pragmatic positions, no matter what ideological ground that you look for, is the way to move forward. And, you know, uh, Taiwan is not going to offer them what China can as a larger, uh, you know, economic powerhouse in that sense. So this is uh, what we are looking at and what we can expect in the near future. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, Anish. Strike action by the workers of the National Education, Health and Allied Workers Union was concluded this week after the government in South Africa agreed to review the salary demands made by the workers. The strike was launched on March 6, following repeated refusals by the government to seriously approach negotiations regarding health workers' salaries and through that, the overall state of the health system. The health workers' strike is a significant step in collective bargaining for the sector as current labour legislation in South Africa makes it illegal for health workers to engage in industrial action, which disrupts essential services, putting into question health workers' right to engage in strike like all other workers. Anna from People's Health Movement now joins us with the latest details on this story. Thanks for joining us, Anna. So, what led to this strike? And it's been going over for at least a week and more than that. Uh, there are some considerable gains uh, that the strike has achieved uh, as is reflected in the agreement. Can you also tell us that? Uh, yes. So essentially what happened was that one of the trade unions uh, in South Africa, which organizes public sector workers in education, in health uh, and uh, similar services, uh, the National Education, Health and Allied Workers Union, uh, it held uh, a 10, 10 day strike uh, over uh, some prolonged disputes over salaries uh, and uh, the government's unwillingness to negotiate uh, a salary rise for this year and then for the next one. So what happened was that uh, the union wanted the government to reopen the discussion about this year's salary, uh, citing inflation and higher costs of living uh, as reasons that the workers were not able to make sense meet on what was agreed before and that it definitely required uh, more substantive uh, more substantive negotiations. So the the govern the government uh, was not willing to do that for a very long time, uh, and this is something that's uh, also reflective of uh, how the government has approached uh, negotiations uh, and dialogue with trade unions since 2020 or even before. Uh, it's not been a very friendly relationship. Let's put it that way. So they uh, they've been very reluctant to do it. Uh, the labor legislation that has been passed is somewhat limiting of trade union ac uh, activities uh, in South Africa. And so these were all com like uh, a list of things that led the union to, to take, to, to take the step and, uh, and initiate the strike. Uh, what should also be mentioned is that the health workers uh, were uh, talking about how austerity measures were impacting the health system and their working conditions for a very long time. So essentially, it's been, you know, they, they have very low salaries, uh, which are not keeping uh, keeping up with uh, what the actual prices are. The whole health system is under strain because of austerity measures. Uh, so it wasn't it wasn't uh, only framed as a strike for for their own rights, but also in a wider sense for for the for the health system. 
And so uh, just, you know, to wrap up a bit about the strike itself, uh, it uh, it was uh, it was ended uh, later yesterday. Uh, it was it was actually announced that it uh, that there was an agreement uh, which was reached, uh, which uh, the union fi- found more more acceptable than what was earlier on the table. Uh, and uh, so um, the the health services are expected to resume and to pick up over the next couple of days. Uh, and finally, of course, you know they, uh, the 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 strike ga- uh, got uh, a lot of solidarity statements from around the world, not only from from the uh, uh, from the rest of the trade union movement in South Africa. We have seen public services international supporting the action taken by the workers, uh, and this is unsurprising in a way, uh, knowing that uh, PSI is so committed to you know better funding for public uh, public services uh, and uh, supporting the role that health workers play in uh, in delivering the services to the, to the people. Uh, right, and the strike was concluded uh, after following some court orders about, uh, and once agreement was reached, what was that about? So uh, essentially, this, uh, the strike, while it was supported by uh, quite a wide, you know, uh, base of people, uh, it also had some contested parts. Uh, so essentially, uh, and this again has a lot to do with the labor uh, legislation that I mentioned before. Uh, it caused uh, widespread disruptions to healthcare services. So it's uh, because there was no minimum agreed with the gov- government. Um, it ended up with people uh, literally having no access to, to essential services like emergency, like maternity, uh, maternity care, and so on. Uh, so this was uh, one of the contested parts and that essentially um, led to the situation where the government deployed military medical uh, staff to uh, to staff the, the hospitals, the health institutions that were covered by the strike. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the pickets uh, got quite quite dynamic and there were also reports of uh, rubber bullets being fired at picketers, at strikers. Uh, and it was an overall uh, quite, uh, quite uh, yes, quite a complicated picture of the strike because as we know, you know, Health workers have every right to take strike action as any other worker. Uh, but the government and the employers usually use this uh, as an excuse to say that health workers are irresponsible, that they are not mindful of their patients' lives or their well-being. Uh, and these kind of situations that arise, uh, which include violence and lack of access to essential services, actually play to, to that narrative. So um, what we have seen in, in this case of, of the uh, latest strike in South Africa uh, is that, you know, uh, people's organizations like the People's Health Movement South Africa was, was very clear uh, in supporting uh, the, um, the right to strike for health workers. Uh, and of course, PHM South Africa is very clear about uh, the strikes and disruption, disruptive actions taken by health workers actually lead to a better health system for all, if that is, that is clearly stated in uh, in the trade union and in the strike demands, and if it it is upheld uh, during the the action uh, the action itself. So that's uh, that's one part that's still uh, still going to be analyzed a bit in the future so to see essentially what happened what was the government's narrative and what was actually what could have actually been organized better to uh, to deliver essential healthcare services at all times thank you so much for joining us lana on this very important issue thanks the global professional soccer players union has sent a letter signed by 150 women's national team players to fifa calling for equal distribution of the world cup prize money This comes a few months before the 2023 Women's World Cup that is set to begin in Australia and New Zealand. The movement for parity in pay has been gathering momentum for some time now and in May 2022, a milestone was reached when the US Soccer Federation agreed to pay both its men's and women's team equally. Siddhant Annie joins us now with more details on this issue. Welcome to this episode, Siddhant. The tournament is around the corner. It's set to start in a few months. But a lot of players from across the national teams, they are set against not playing this tournament if their demands are not met. Uh, why so? Uh, th- thanks, Shia, uh, for having me. It's good to swap places uh, with you from yesterday's show. Uh, 
Um, yeah, the World Cup, the tournament that you're referring to, of course, is the FIFA Women's World Cup uh, 2023, which is being held in Australia and New Zealand, set to begin uh, in July, in just a few months from now. And not just uh, some players, uh, Shriya, but uh, actually a large number of some of the best players in the world are likely to miss out on what would otherwise be the highlight of any player's career, something that you sort of dream about playing at a at a World Cup, representing your country and playing against the best players and with the best players uh, in the world. Uh, and unfortunately, some of these uh, amazingly talented uh, footballers will be forced if their respective federations uh, don't get in line to give the tournament a miss, not because uh, they want to, uh, but because they are actually now at a stage where they are fighting for the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is essentially one that has been fought by, I suppose, generations of women for uh, decades, which is equal pay for equal work. Uh, you know, so, so if you look at football as an industry uh, and the jobs that these professional athletes do, uh, this is how they earn their livelihood. And uh, what, what they seek in return is, of course, a decent living wage. Uh, and secondly, conditions in which they can perform to their uh, best potential. Uh, that's essentially all uh, that they are looking for. And unfortunately, it's 2023 and we are still at a stage where that fight takes up so much time and energy for these women footballers uh, that it often detracts from their ability to concentrate on what they want to do, which is play football, uh, reach as wide an audience as possible. Uh, of course, in that process, inspire young people uh, to also uh, inculcate, develop a love of not just the sport, but the idea of playing a team sport uh, and functioning as a collective and being part of a club and all of the other things that go with uh, with football that make it, uh, that give it the kind of universal global popularity that the sport has. On the one hand, we are seeing uh, organizations like FIFA, which runs the sport at a global level, uh, talk consistently about how the World Cup, which is their tournament, their flagship event, how it's doing better uh, year on year on year. Television numbers are up, uh, sponsorship revenues are up. The tournament is now developing into one that uh, can potentially be uh, a money spinner, just like the FIFA Men's World Cup is uh, for the organization. And then, then as they are structured, uh, they are still very much based on the idea of trickle down economics. So, so then that then gives you the wherewithal to in engage in other programs. And use some of that money and put it towards building things at the grassroots level. We're not getting into a discussion about how things are structured. We're, we're talking only specifically about what's happening with the women. Uh, and, you know, following the United States is quite successful collective bargaining uh, uh, process, negotiation agreement, which also took, by the way, many, many years and a protracted legal battle to happen. But finally, it took the men's players union and the women's players union coming together Right? And to say that, okay, whatever amount uh, we collectively uh, generate, we will share equally between the men's national team and the women's national team. Now, this is essentially the same kind of uh, contract or argument that all teams are now asking for, and rightly so. Uh, you know, it's countries like uh, Canada, Spain, and France, in this case, who are all major, uh, I guess, players at the women's football world stage. So all of them have extremely talented players, some of the best players in the world. Uh, Lyon in France is one of the biggest clubs for women. Uh, Barcelona in Spain is another one. Uh, these are uh, clubs that regularly are the best football clubs in the world. Uh, they also have the biggest budgets uh, and some of the best players in the world. So if at this level also, there is still a struggle for uh, basics like you know playing time, training conditions, regular tournaments, uh, and of course, then equal pay for the kind of work that they're doing. Uh, it, it takes a lot away from from the point of it, which is which is to go out and play football, which is what uh, these players are and their representatives and the FIFA Fifth Pro, which is the the World Professional Players Union. They are all arguing for that. You know, uh, you have to set the basics in place before you can then expect this sport to become something that generates uh, viewership and uh, significant interest outside of those who are directly involved in it. Thank you so much for joining us, Sudhan. And that's all we have for today. For more such stories, keep following peoplesdispatch.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter.